So hello everyone, Ken here back with another exciting data science video for you. Today I'm interviewing Tim Bowling, who is one of my friends, and he has a really interesting background. He comes from NASA as a physicist and has transitioned to data science. So how are you doing today, Tim? Six out of ten. <laughs> Perfect. So Tim, why don't you tell me a little bit about your background, what you went to school for, and uh, the work that you did prior to becoming a data scientist. So I went to um, school for undergrad for physics and for music. Studied both, realized I could get a job in physics and not music. I was explains the tattoos. Yeah, got, it now. I got, got some music and some physics tattoos. I like it. I like it. Yeah. Um, so I continued on in physics. I worked in the pharmaceutical industry as a biophysicist for one year, then I went to grad school because I wanted to go camping, so I decided to become a geologist. Um, ended up not getting to go camping, really, for that. I you know, became a numerical physicist studying geophysics. I did my master's in uh, plasma physics in the ionosphere of the Earth, which is the high atmosphere. And then I went on to do my PhD in planetary physics, so basically studying uh, how planets are formed um, and my, my main focus was on how uh, asteroid impacts, like the kind that killed the dinosaurs, contributes to shaping worlds. And like, if we see a world somewhere in another, around another sun, we can say, why is it so rocky? Maybe it's asteroid impacts. Um, as I finished my PhD, I kind of um, continued on uh, down a line of research that really looked more and more at asteroid impacts and um, their effect on life, on habitability. Like if you have a planet that gets hit, like Mars, for example, it's cold, but if you hit it a lot, you make lots of hot molten rock that heats up ground ice and makes liquid water. You can have microbes live in that. So I started down a, a line investigating um, habitability and asteroid impacts for a couple of years at University of Chicago and then at NASA. That's and, awesome. and yeah, so I was doing that and then I decided to. Uh, transfer out of academia and into industry via data science. So before we get into the data science, I saw Avengers Endgame last night. Yeah, I haven't seen how, it. how does that, you know, how would you imagine that that checks out from a physics perspective? Probably really well. <laughs> okay. Yeah, <laughs> just yeah, yeah. And I'm guessing it's pretty much 100% on point. Nice. So, so what interested you in data science to begin with? So um, there, I mean, I've been doing analytics um, style work and for a long time, especially on the NASA side, when we we're getting um, returns from spacecraft missions. Um, and I realized that it was a good career path to take in the industry was via data science. I actually didn't have a lot of the requisite skills because I was more of a theorist. I didn't deal with large amounts of data like the way I do now. So I, it took some retraining to kind of get my skill set up to date, but um, past that in terms of problem solving analysis and stuff like that, it was really a, a natural jump from the type of work I was doing in space science into data science. Wow, and so do you remember how you first heard about data science or the first person that told you about it, kind of uh, what that general impression was? It's become uh, slowly a um, hype term across fields, so like you start seeing I it yeah, you start seeing it. Uh, um, at the same time, it's popping up in like Harvard Business Review. It's also popping up in classrooms and in lectures um, in academia as well. So, like, someone gives a talk now, they might say, "Hey, we used you know twenty years ago." They'd say, "Like, we used this statistical technique to analyze our data," and now they say, "We use machine learning and." Data science and to analyze our data. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it became I don't I don't know exactly where like it really entered my consciousness is maybe this is a good career path um, out of academia because I was looking at kind of how can I exit academia um, gracefully and find an interesting path into industry, um, and I'm not exactly sure when it entered my consciousness as like this is a good option. But sometime in the past uh, couple of years. So, you also did a data science boot camp, correct? I did, yeah. So, because I was a theorist, I, and um, 
So I was good. I'm good with math, like my PhD, my academic work. A lot of math, a lot of computer programming for um, simulations, like when you see, you know, a movie of like this is what an asteroid impact looks like, and that kind of thing. Yeah, um, that was one of the things. Yeah, something like that. Um, fluid dynamics, really, like when you see like a video of how does air flow around an airplane, and that kind of thing. That was the type of simulation I was good at. Um, but that's not exactly the same type of thing in analyzing data. And so I decided the best way to make the jump into industry was to go through one of these boot camps. Uh, because I was interested in getting back to Chicago at the time I was living in Boulder, I found that the best one in this city was Metis. And so I enrolled in that in last fall. And so and is that a, you know a data science bootcamp something you would recommend to everyone, or do you think that that's for specific people, uh, perhaps coming from your situation, or, or what? Uh, where do you win? You have to you have to recognize that data science bootcamps are for profit institutions, right? So they're out to take you and make money off of you. Um, so I think they're recruiting a lot of people who it might not necessarily be the best thing for them, right? For me, it ended up being a great option because I have a really strong quantitative background. I'm great with math. I'm great with computer programming, things like that. It, you know, I went into this boot camp and I learned, hey, these are the latest, greatest packages and techniques that people are using in industry and data science. And here's where you find them. Here's how you plug them in. Yeah. Um, here's how you apply them in industry. It was great for me because I didn't. I already had this really strong quantitative basis. There were also people who go into these boot camps who don't, you know, like you have people coming from like a poetry background. It's much more of a struggle. And to think that you're going to be able to go through a 12 week boot camp and know how to answer questions and know how to set up programming stacks and things like that and be a data scientist after 12 weeks. I mean, I did a, a two, two and a half year master's degree in yeah. computer science and I still am, yeah. you know, floundering a lot, yeah. around a lot of the time. And I think the, one of the biggest things that a boot camp can't teach you is how to solve problems. And this is why a lot of companies look for people with masters and PhDs is because that's, it doesn't really matter what problem you're working on, it's how do you solve a problem? How do you, and the hardest part of that is how do you ask the right questions in the first place? Um, and that's not something you're able to learn in a boot camp, in a, any boot um, so I think for a certain subset of people, a boot camp can be a really, really good option. It worked great for me. Like I, I, I went through it, I learned a ton, and jumped immediately into the industry. The job seeking process was fantastic. The boot camp helped out a lot with that as well. But for other people, I think it's a much harder task. And, and, and that's because there's no free lunch. You can't just do a 12 week jump across industries and walk in as an expert, you know, it just doesn't happen. And so, obviously, the types of problems that you were solving before, or trying to understand better before, were related to asteroid collisions. Yeah. What types of problems are you trying to solve and understand now as a data scientist? Well, so now um, it's really about profitability in a business and kind of baselining using the um, data that the company that I work for has to understand our level of profitability, our level of um, our, what different routes in our business are the most profitable and how we can make them more profitable. Um, at, its, at its base, that's really what data science and industry is all about. Um, it's in some sense predictive because what you're doing is you're trying to go a step beyond just the simple analysis of, oh, we had this much revenue and this much spend and that kind of thing. And, in these um, areas. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so what you're really trying to look for is like, how do we look into the future to predict where we should be spending money to make the highest amount of profit? Um, and there's a ton of different ways that that's applied. I found that uh, now it's working on tons of different projects all at once. And um, usually in a way that like you're doing a lot of data engineering, you're doing a lot of data, you're doing data science, but like 10% of the time, mm -hmm. the rest of the time it's data engineering, getting all of your pipelines set up. But I think that's pretty standard across any industry. I don't yeah. know if that was an answer. I think it was, I think it was a pretty good answer. 
Um, so before you know transitioning to this role, what were some of the like assumptions or the preconceived notions you had about it, and how has a data science role either proved those to be you know, correct or diverged from your assumptions going in? Um, yeah, actually, I don't know. I you know when you're in academia, you kind of get in this. Uh, mindset that the smartest, best people in the world are all in academia. And then you get out of academia and you realize that there's a ton of really, really smart people. Maybe people like me. I don't know about that. <laughs> but there's tons of really, really smart people that work at this company and at other companies that chose this route for good reasons and they're really, really bright and they're doing really great work. And so it's not like, one of, one of the preconceived notions I have is like, if I leave academia, I'm going to like, not work with as high caliber people anymore. And I was wrong about that. I worked with some very high caliber people. I think. Nice, that's awesome. And so just purely in terms of you know, data science work, what's your favorite tool? What's your um, you know language of choice? And you know, just tell me a little bit about the things that you enjoy doing on a day-to-day -day basis. My language of choice is Python. Uh, before I came here, I, in academia, I was doing a lot of Fortran. I would do my modeling in Fortran and my analysis in MATLAB. And since then, I've really gone full on Python. That's great. It's so intuitive. It works so well. As far as um, data science method, like what's my favorite method, I'm very much still in the boat of uh, the simplest tool to solve a problem. So, I mean, there's a lot of pressure in... That's called Occam's razor, correct? I don't know. I don't know if that's right. No, that's the simplest. That's the most right. likely answer to a given problem is probably correct. Yes. This... <laughs> in this case, let's say you need to build a classifier for something um, within our business context. Maybe it's like will buy or won't buy customers and we know some things about them. You could build a neural net or something that's like all you really care about is getting as accurate as possible. And you could do that. There's tons of tools that you can do that really quickly now. Things like TensorFlow, Keras, uh, PyTorch. You can build tools like that pretty easily and pretty quickly. And those they work really, really well, but they're not explainable. They're not stable. Um, even things that everybody loves to turn to random forest is very powerful, but it's not super explainable. So yeah, when I can get away with using something like a linear model, I always do. Um, and the, one of the big reasons there is linear models are not just explainable, they're directly explainable. So if you pull the coefficients out of something like a logistic re regression, yeah. you can say like men are worth 66% more to us than women. You can pull that. That's a terrible example. I have no idea what I want with men and women there. That was totally pulled out of my ass. But <laughs> but uh, um, uh, you can you can actually directly interpret the coefficient. So if you can use a linear model to solve a problem at the fidelity you want, you should always use a linear model. You shouldn't use sure. any more. And you know, I think a lot of people forget that not everyone is a data scientist. Yeah. And in order for someone on the business side of an organization to like actually want to implement something or actually go along with something, like they have to be able to understand it. Yeah. And a lot of the time, you know, in, in every business, it's a lot easier to explain that like, this line fits to this, and these features mean this much, than trying to say, like, look at all these random trees, and, like, they average out to mean something. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, that's just the level of complexity you're absolutely right is. It just an explainability is super, super important. Yeah. I only really have two more, two more questions. Um, the first is, obviously, you learned a lot in physics, but what have you learned um, since you transi transitioned careers that, that it has really been, like, uh, kind of a, an eye-opening moment or you know, that's, that's made you think a little bit. Use other people's libraries. I, yeah. I used to always just write all of my own stuff, even like if I had to do linear regression, I would just write my own linear regression because it's not that complex of an algorithm, so I'd just shove it in there. Since I've really jumped into the Python verse and data science universe, it's like I'm not writing my own stuff if I don't have to. Somebody already wrote a really clean class to solve most of the problems that I need to solve. So I just use their stuff and why not? Uh, that has been nice. Awesome, awesome. And then 
Uh, the last thing is, you know, talk a little bit about your working style. Do you have any quirks about how you do data science, or do you have any, you know, outstanding beliefs about what data science should be or what it shouldn't be? Uh, I feel like it's a field in flux, so. I think the data science, the people who are going to get paid the most money in data science are going to be the people who um, push a return, like in 10 years, are going, because there's so much um, automation, so many tools that basically are going to become a single button in Excel in the next 10 years. It's going to be the people who really seek to understand the algorithms and seek to understand <clears throat> the statistical underpinnings of data science that are going to be the ones that are sought after going forward. Like basically pushing yourself back to being a statistician instead of a data scientist in terms of title is going to be, those are going to be the most valuable people. So related to that, do you have any, aside from focusing more on the statistic statistical implementation. Do you have any recommendations on someone trying to get into the field, how they should go about it, uh, what they should study, what they should look at? Yeah, um, so it depends on what part of your career you're coming from. If you're like about to go into college and you want to become a data scientist, I would say don't go into a data science program. Study CS or statistics or physics as an undergrad. I think a discussion that every single data scientist we have came from a physics background, which I found yeah. fascinating. Yeah. I mean, CS is also valuable. Like, that's where one of our data scientists actually came from, CS. It's like, yeah, they can do all kinds of magic that I wish I could do. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, don't, I wouldn't at this point go into a, a data science program. I, Maybe that'll change in some time. I feel like that's just going to be a weird hybrid of the things you actually need to be good at. Um, if you're mid-career, you're already working as an analyst or something like that somewhere, and you want to make the jump over to data science. I'd say the way they go about doing it. <clears throat> if you already, if you if you feel like taking the risk, join one of the boot camps. It can it can work, but it's a big risk. It costs money. You. I think there's a lot of people who are like, can I do this nights and weekends? And it's like, nah, you gotta jump in. You have to like give it the time it deserves or you're just not gonna be good at it. An alternative to that though is like working on things in your own time on Kaggle or uh, doing kind of MOOCs um, over time to pick up some of the fundamental techniques. Basically build yourself out a resume of projects where like I, solved this data science problem and wrote it up on, here's a blog post, here's a GitHub repo, get a bunch of those under your belt and then people are gonna take you seriously when you apply. I agree, I mean, I constantly stress, especially when we're interviewing candidates, that I think personal projects are the coolest things. They show that you're interested in data science, that you have the initiative to do it on your own. I mean, that tells me that someone is probably gonna be passionate about their work. Yeah. if they're willing to like work in their free time. Yeah. Um, you know, that's really all the questions I have. Thank you so much for coming in.